Boldwood Presents Always the Bridesmaid Written by Laura Carter And read by Jessica Preddy and Isaac Stanmore The moral right of the author has been asserted This performance is owned by Boldwood Chapter 1 Sarah Oh yeah, God, that's good I groan I told you I'd find the spot. You have. You really have. I'm suspended from a reclaimed teak frame in Izzy's recently renovated dance studio. What used to be a stage for her salsa-yourself-fit classes has been replaced by an aerial yoga setup. As I shift to see myself in the wall of mirrors that line one side of the studio, I can see the effect hanging upside down is having on my body. Tomato red face, long brown locks escaping the knot I had tied on the top of my head, the flesh of my cheeks sagging with gravity. It defies logic that Izzy makes this look immensely glamorous on TikTok. My unsightly appearance aside, Izzy has found the exact spot on my lower back that has been playing up recently, from too many hours spent lifting boxes of files and paper at work. Drew, lawyer, boss, and one of my best friends, has taken a case defending his long-standing client, vehicle manufacturing giant Rolando. As his legal secretary of more than a decade, Drew trusts me more than any paralegal or junior associate at the firm. And so I have spent the last 12 days straight trawling through box after box of paperwork disclosed by the other side, a minority shareholder in Rolando, looking for one tiny receipt. The smoking gun that will prove that the applicant couldn't have been where he said he was at the precise moment the applicant's entire case hinges on. I lugged those boxes up and down from tabletops and carried the heavy files home to keep going through the night, meaning I had to abandon my near-daily yoga practice and tweaked my back. Breathe through it, Izzy says as she stands behind me holding on to my thighs and leaning into my hips, getting straight to that sweet spot around my spine. I'm having a head rush, I tell her, my voice sounding peculiar in my ears as if I'm speaking in a fishbowl. The shout follows my other friend, Andrew's fiance, Becky, crashing to the soft floor beneath her as her silk ropes have somehow twisted, turned, and flipped her out onto the surface. Ouch, she says, lying in the exaggerated position that a cartoon character who has been knocked over by a truck might lie in. What on earth? Izzy says as she ditches me and moves to collect her fellow Brit and friend from the floor. What were you doing? I've no idea. Becky says, coming up to sit with Izzy's help. I think maybe that's part of the problem. I can't help but laugh. I laugh so hard my own gangly legs somehow unravel from their holstered position, and I too fall into a heap on the ground. Glancing sideways to Becky, I reach out to take hold of her hand and laugh harder. What a calamity you both are, Izzy says, trying to maintain professionalism for the benefit of the other five women attending her class, each of whom looks remarkably more chic than Becky and me. Is this what you meant by being transformed into a butterfly from our cocoons? I ask. Despite her efforts, Izzy's voice breaks, and the corners of her lips defy her, turning upward right before she too folds over and we are all laughing together. The very definition of lasting friendship. I'm sitting on a stool at the food bar in the gym, flanked by Becky and Izzy, where a large coconut milk latte and a slice of French toast with berries and maple syrup have been placed in front of me. 
Izzy has just been handed a green detox smoothie. Sorry, Izzy, I say, digging the side of a fork into my French toast. I was willing to rouse from my hard-earned slumber and make the trek to Brooklyn for a 9.15 class on a Sunday morning, but I draw the line at having a vegetable-packed smoothie for breakfast. Below where we are sitting, we can see men and women swimming laps of the gym pool. The Williamsburg franchise is the latest addition to the Brooks Adams gym empire. Despite Brooks's insistence that he pay for the legal advice and the discount that Drew gave, I happen to know that it actually cost the firm money. But Drew is a partner in the firm. He has the power to do that, and I fully endorse him supporting Brooks, who has been his best friend since kindergarten and one of my best friends for almost as long as I have known Drew. What pleases me more is that I genuinely love Both Brooks and Drew have previously had relationships that I did not approve of, ones which I knew were doomed from the start and which were ultimately only about the bedroom. It's not as if I have the final say, or any say really, in who my friends date, but I more than encouraged them both to find their happily ever afters with Becky and Izzy. I suppose you could say that is one of my things, matchmaking. In particular, matchmaking for my friends. And the next two weeks are further proof of just how skilled I am in coupling people up. I'm so excited for the wedding, I say, untying my hair from my knot and letting it fall down my back, tickling my shoulders, which are exposed in my workout vest. I can't wait to see Jess in her bridal gown, Jess is marrying Drew's younger brother Jake next weekend, and I credit myself with ultimately having nudged the couple from friends with benefits to life partners, or I at least played a significant role in helping them get their acts together. We'll all be staying in a house I've arranged for us, using Drew's credit card to pay the rent, in Surrey, apparently a ceremonial county in southeast England, according to Wikipedia in the week running up to the wedding. The week after, I'm staying in London to see the British sights. And I can't wait for us all to be together again, I add, shielding the half-eaten breakfast in my mouth with my hand as I speak. My first trip to England. I know I say this all the time, but it's crazy that all of the guys fell for Brits. I love it. Are you excited to be going home? While I sip my latte and take another inelegant bite of French toast, dabbing excess icing sugar from the side of my mouth with a napkin, I note the exchange of apprehensive looks between Becky and Izzy. Come on, it won't be so bad, I say, attempting to sound reassuring. Won't it? Izzy asks, one eyebrow raised in question. My sister let slip to my parents that I'll be back in the country, They want to have lunch. Lunch sounds nice, no? I can feel my face twist, as if I'm bracing myself for falling debris landing on my head. Not just lunch. Lunch with Brooks and his daughter. They're still grieving the career they always wanted me to have, using the degree that they paid for. They still think music, health, and fitness is like my gap year career, They don't get TikTok and Insta. They don't realize I... Or maybe they do, and they still don't care because I'm not some kind of literary correspondent for The Guardian. Hmm, you never know. Maybe they've missed you and thought about things, and... Sarah, I assure you, it would be the worst lunch imaginable. I'm not sure where to go with this. I don't think I have a strong message of positivity off the cuff... So in a while, I'm going to have to come back to you with some kind of Sarah affirmation. For now, there's always French toast. If you would indulge just one time. It's worth the cows, I promise. I take another bite of my toast and purr as if I'm making love to it. Izzy rolls her eyes, but her amusement is evident. And how about you, Becky? Are you looking forward to it?